Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here on behalf of the Coalition of California Utility Employees. Um, I've appeared before the Public Utilities Commission for more than 25 years, including more than 20 years of rate cases. I want to echo some of the things that Connie Jackson said from the perspective of someone who spent way too much time in the trenches. <laughs> I'm wondering if he's been in the trenches. I don't know. Um, we had, there's a structural problem at the commission. It's not about the people. There are, there are good people at the commission. There are good people at the utilities. And there are commissioners who, who are, have tried to do their best, but they're swimming upstream against a structural problem. And the proposed division of, of uh, safety analysis would help. It would not be, it's not the complete solution, but would help solve that structural problem. The way the rate case works, you've got three or four or five weeks of testimony going over hundreds of line items, and they're all about how much money, how much money, how much money. You have an institutional intervener, you have the Office of, of Ratepayer Advocates, an institutional intervener whose mission is to seek lower rates. You've got TURN, a, a semi-institutional intervener, um, and, and Tom Long and his colleagues do an excellent job um, with their mission, which is focused on rates. Um, you have other interveners representing uh, agricultural community, industrials, um, oil companies, all of them are really focused on rates. None of them are there with their primary mission being safety. So what you have is safety is the output of a bunch of financial decisions, a bunch of money decisions. It's not an input. You know, the commission is not making decisions based on how much safety do we want, how much are we willing to pay for. Safety is the result of a bunch of decisions about how much money are we going to spend. So, you know, things like the number, how many poles are going to get replaced, how many miles of gas, how many uh, gas main distribution lines are going to get replaced, how many circuit breakers are going to be replaced, those are all money decisions, not what's the effect on safety. And, you know, this has been highlighted several times where we have actually asked ORA's witness, when you made your recommendation on this topic for how much money the utility should get, did you consider safety when making your analysis? And the answer we've gotten under oath is no, flat out no. And that's because it's not their mission. So when it gets to the commissioners to make a decision, they have a very unbalanced record. They've got dozens and dozens of witnesses who've testified about how much money it should be, but none typically whose sole focus is what's the safety uh, outcome that we want. Now, we, Q, we try, but we can't fill the gap with our, you know, one witness. Um, so we have put in testimony that says, uh, in fact, very recently in the, in the, the raid case, um, look, pg &E says the distribution gas mains have a lifetime of 100 years, but you're replacing at a rate which won't get them replaced, you know, on a 100-year cycle. We've said, look, we all know that um, LDLA uh, pipe is bad product. It's a plastic pipe we've known for decades. It's defective. And the proposal from the utility is it won't get replaced until um, 2066 before the last of it is gone. 2066, for another 50 years. Right. And in 1998, the NTSB said it should be replaced. Exactly. Exactly. And ORA has said in their testimony, that's just fine. Let's not spend the money. You know, the, the same story with poles. The, uh, the utility is proposing to replace poles on a 116-year cycle. ORA says that's just fine. 116 years. That means they would be just fine with having poles in the ground today that were put in there before the airplane was invented. It's craziness. And it's an institutional structural problem that we have to solve. Now, you know, I've said we, we try, but it's hard for the commissioners to hear us over, you know, our 1% of the case over the 99% of the case that's about money. Um, the question was raised, does, would a division of safety advocates um, relieve the commissioners of their duty? I would say just the opposite. It actually enables the commissioners 
to do their duty because they'll actually have a record before them which says here are the safety implications and you know you have commissioners you have to make a policy decision um, safety is not free the ratepayers do not have infinite amounts of money but you have to balance um, how much safety how much risk are we willing to tolerate how much are we willing to spend right now they don't have the data to make those decisions and we need a structural improvement so that we have an institutional participant that gives them the data to make those decisions. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much. Very good. Appreciate it. Very good. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Senator Leiva, of course. Thank you. So safety is the result of how much money are we going to spend. So really what you're saying is we need to fundamentally change the way we look at things and not look at it by dollars, but actually address the issue of safety and not worry about how much it's going to cost. We need to have safety being an input to the rate case, not just an output. Right. Um, and um, as I said, and I'm, I'm sure Mr. Wong will, will agree, safety is not free. Right. No. So we can't say, you know, infinite safety at infinite cost. Um, but we have to have it be a driving force rather than a product of financial decisions. Totally agree. So maybe you can let us know in the future how we can help with that because I think what happens a lot of time is, is safety is put on the back burner because whoever doesn't want to spend the money and then we end up paying in the law. You either pay on the front end or you pay on the right. back end. And we end up paying on the back end when someone dies or someone gets severely injured. So we need to look at that differently. I, I agree. And whatever we can do to be helpful on that, let us know. Thank you. Thank Senator you. Bradley. Yes, to the um, same presenter there. Thank you for that testimony. Um, but there are other options, are they not? Not just rate increases versus public safety. What is the responsibility of the utility? Yes. Uh, and not just protecting their shareholders' profit margin. There, it seems like uh, having lived through the Aliso Canyon thing, you didn't want to raise rates, so we didn't do any preventative ma maintenance or deferred maintenance on our wells. So there is another option besides just rate increases Absolutely. in this mix, yes. and that's what the off and the Office of Ratepayer Advocates obviously just looks narrowly at that. So how do you how do you get into that discussion? Um, I'm glad you raised that. Um, Several several responses. One is there's no question in the short term the utility has the obligation to do what it takes to make the system safe. Um, over the longer term, the commission has the obligation to fund the utility to be able to do that activity. Right. Um, and the third point I'd make um, is because we've been you know acutely concerned with the fact that you can't just go in there and say, give them more money and tell them to spend it on doing things to make it safe because there is this countervailing pressure of, on rates. So what we have said uh, in the most recent um, rate case is look at the depreciation rates because if the utility is depreciating poles on a 45-year cycle, that means they're getting fully paid for their investment in poles on a 45-year cycle, and they're replacing them on a 120-year cycle, something is wrong here. Marry the two up. And you can, without any rate increase at all, have the utility spend more money uh, on replacing poles in a cycle which matches their expected life. So there are ways to do this with a little creative thinking that don't just keep going back to the rate periods and say, spend more, spend more, spend more. Thanks. Um, Asander Pavli, um, what we put in our, um, in our justification for, for this division, we said part of the division of uh, this division's role will be to determine whether additional safety improvements are required and who should bear the cost. So if, it's, if the necessary safety improvements are needed, even though the utility has prudently managed its, its assets, reasonable costs for these improvements would be paid, should be recovered by rate pairs. Mm -hmm. However, if the cost needed, um, if the improvements needed due to imprudence or failure of the utility to comply with statutes and rules and their own inspection uh, schedules, then the shareholders should bear the cost. And part of our, part of the role of this division is to bring that forth uh, through testimony. You know, and I guess one of the things is, is depreciation just an accounting figure or is, 
isn't risk analysis supposed to be part of the equation somewhere in, in the uh, in the rate cases and in the entire financial scheme? I'm going to tiptoe up to the edge of a complete answer because it's right at the edge of, of my expertise. Depreciation is the, is the amount of money the utility gets to be paid back for its investment in capital stock. And it can be paid back over different periods of time. Obviously, the faster you pay it back, the higher the rates are in the short term. The longer you pay it back, the lower the rates are. And the, the point I was trying to make is that, yes, it's accounting, but it's important accounting because if there's a mismatch between the depreciation rate the utility is getting paid for and the rate at which they're actually replacing the infrastructure, then that should be fixed. And by slowing down the rate at which they're being paid back and increasing the rate at which they're replacing to, to get much closer to a match, you can get safer, uh, newer utility infrastructure without raising rates. And that's what the risk analysis will help. And, and we would hope that the future Division of Safety uh, analysis would think along those lines. Yeah. That, uh, very good. Thank you. Any other, no other further questions? Mr. Long. Legal Director for the Utility Reform Network. Term. Thank, Thank you, you Senator Hale and members. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I want to begin by talking about uh, our perception of the problem we're trying to solve here today. Uh, simply stated, utilities are not operating their systems safely enough. The San Bruno disaster in 2010 and the San Diego County wildfires in 2010 have been something of a wake-up call to the, to the utilities but there are still troubling safety lapses that have led to accidents and disasters, and we've talked about them already this morning, such as Aliso Canyon, the Butte wildfire, and also the Carmel explosion in 2014. So the question for today's hearing is how can regulation and oversight by the commission be improved, but let's not forget that it's the utilities that are responsible ultimately for these safety failures. Now the utilities are spending a considerable amount of ratepayer money ostensibly to make their system safer, but they're not getting the job done. And I, I want to follow up on one of the examples that Mr. Joseph gave. Uh, he talked about all delay pipe. Um, Turn um, fully agrees with Mr. Joseph that all delay pipe is one of the most um, serious safety risks in the utilities gas systems. Uh, in the last pg &E rate case in 2014, pg &E proposed replacing 100 miles of all delay mains, that's the bigger pipes, um, per year. Turn said that's not enough. It should be higher. We proposed 139 miles. The commission, to its credit, agreed with us. So what did PG&E do? They re replaced in the last three years an average of 40 miles of all delay main. They found things that they thought were more important to do and were also worried about meeting their financial targets instead of doing the main replacement work that the commission ordered them to do. Turn recommended and the commission agreed. So. Uh, I make the point for two reasons. One, it's, it's ultimately how the utilities spend their money and how they choose, what priorities they choose that matters here. That's the, that's the end game. And um, that's what we have to be watching out for, is how, what priorities they, they, they place and, and um, how they decide to allocate their money. So that leads to my, my second um, perception of the problem, my sub second issue. The utilities are not doing a good enough job of prioritizing and optimizing the ratepayer money that they're given to spend to reduce safety. They're not selecting the portfolio of mitigations that will reduce risk to a tolerable level in the most cost-effective manner possible. Third, uh, our third view of the problem, the commission does indeed need more resources for safety regulation and enforcement and more independent expertise. It's just too big a job. There are not enough inspectors, not enough auditors in the field, not enough investigators and attorneys to bring enforcement cases, and not enough expertise to offer an independent perspective to the utilities about where the safety pro problems lie. So now about the Division of Safety Advocates proposal. We view that as 
a step in the right direction to addressing these problems, but the proposal needs to be better focused. First, it's good to have an advocate for safety, but an advocate that fo focuses solely on safety without considering cost is not going to be very helpful. And this is following up on Senator Pavley's questions. The fact is, safety risks can never be fully eliminated. Difficult choices have to be made about how much risk to try to reduce and what risks to focus on. There's a trade-off between risk reduction and cost. And this trade-off is enshrined in the law. Sections 451 and 963 of the Public Utilities Code require the Commission to make safety the top priority consistent with just and reasonable rates. Now, here's an example. It's true that there's a lot of aging infrastructure in the utility systems. Now, a true safety-only advocate might propose that we should just flash cut, replace all of it. And sure, that would make the system safer, but it, it wouldn't be a helpful proposal in a general rate case because ratepayers simply could not afford the massive investment that would be required. So I don't understand this idea of looking at safety only without considering cost. They have to be considered hand in hand. In the real world of limited resources, the hard work in rate cases is figuring out how to prioritize and optimize ratepayer funding. What's the best portfolio of risk mitigations considering all of the potential options for reducing safety risk? So to be truly useful, it's not enough for this new division to advocate for safety. It needs to advocate for safety at reasonable cost. Second, the proposed safety division could play a very important and useful role in making the best use of quantitative risk models. And I want to talk a little bit about that. The commission, and it's been, it's been referenced in, in Mr. Sullivan's testimony, has directed the utilities to use quantitative modeling to identify their most significant risks and to prioritize the most cost-effective risk mitigation efforts. TURN fully supports this effort. In fact, I've spent much of the last two years trying to move this effort ahead as productively as possible. This, uh, these, the proceedings where we've been doing it have been the rate case plan proceeding where we're trying to inject safety into rate cases. And now this, it's called the SMAP case, the safety model assessment proceeding, where we're spending a lot of time focusing on the utility's quantitative models and making the, making the best they can possibly be. Quantitative models will only be useful, however, if the models themselves use a sound methodology and use good information for inputs into the models. And I'm worried that there are just too many risks and programs being modeled for the current interveners, ORA, TURN, and the other interveners to effectively analyze the inputs and the outputs of these models. So here's where a new safety division could play a very important role, providing an independent analysis, and I mean independent, of the utility's risk models and their inputs and outputs, and making alternative proposals to optimize the portfolio of risk mitigations. Third, the safety division's analysis needs to be independent of the utilities. And here I agree with uh, Ms. Jackson. Our concern is that historically, when the commission staff feels under-resourced, all too often they feel forced to rely on the utilities personnel for training, sometimes formal, but usually informal. This creates a tremendous opportunity for the utilities to frame the issues from their perspective and to bias the analysis. The utilities will spend as much time as they're allowed to do just that. As I said at the outset, the problem is that the utilities are not operating safely enough. If the new safety division were to be simply a rubber stamp for the utilities, we won't be solving the problem. To address this risk, I would suggest at a minimum allocating more money in the safe, new safety division for established experts as the new division gets going, gets up and running, including experts in quantitative modeling, because I see that as a very important role for this division so that the independent experts and not the utilities are training the staff members of the new division. Fourth, increased funding for a new division shouldn't squeeze out funding for the essential work of field audits and inspections and more enforcement actions. Field work is essential to understanding the utility systems. And enforcement actions are critical to getting the financial incentives for the utilities right. Utilities need to know that if they mess up when it comes to safety, they're going to have to pay a steep price. So in conclusion, utility customers and ratepayers have a right to expect that both the utilities and the Public Utilities Commission are protecting them 
from the most important safety risks and doing so cost effectively. A safety division refocused, as I have described, could be a good use of ratepayer money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question on the focusing on risk models, though, yes. assumes that uh, the, the inputs, the hazards, you know, are correctly identified. Correct. I mean, that's, that's right. And that's, and as I say, that's that is the nub of the issue. The utilities are doing it now. It's all disguised in their hundreds, thousands of pages, their hundreds of exhibits and thousands of pages of documents. This quantitative model can be a transparent way for us to see what, which risks they're identifying as the most important risks. And then interveners like Turn, ORA, and hopefully a division of safety analysis that is focusing on this can question them and say, wait a minute, your experts that came to this conclusion really weren't looking at the right issues, uh, your scoring is off, we would propose a different score. That's what I, what I would hope would be happening mm -hmm. in rate cases, making the, these, trans, these, these quantitative models a basis for a transparent evaluation of whether the utilities are assessing the right risks and whether they're using their resources in the right way. That can be a, a great step forward, um, but um, we need all the help we can get. And, and how would we differentiate between a, an intervener who looks at safety only with an intervener that looks at safety first? Well, How would you differentiate I mean, that? Is, is there... it, it, I think it's, it's a fine idea for, for um, the division to say, our focus is going to be safety first. We're not going to think about cost in the first instance. We're going to look at safety first. But the way it was presented in the budget change proposal, it's as if they're not going to think about cost at all, at all. And that's just not the real world. So. Um, we have limited funds. We can't do everything. Where are we going to prioritize? So it all comes down to prioritizing and optimizing. And I, I just don't like this idea that, that people who, th who focus on cost are, you know, are, are, are wrongheaded about this. I mean, we need, we need everybody looking at it from a variety of different perspectives. If this agency, if this division looks at it from the perspective of safety first, which is the perspective we try to bring as well, we always are trying to think about whether we're, our proposals are going to have an adverse effect on safety or whether they're going to have a beneficial effect on safety. And um, in fact, sometimes we've suggested that the utilities do more, as I gave the, in the example of all delay, more than they're proposing because that's what's right for safety. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Long. Appreciate it. Any questions? Yes, Senator Leva. I, I would just say that I have to respectfully disagree. I think that we have to look at safety first. If um, we can look, of course, look at cost. I completely understand there's not an infinite amount of money in anything, but if safety isn't our first, um, the number one issue, and cost is the number one issue, then we are always going to, we are always going to put safety on the the back burner because we only want to spend X amount of dollars. Well, thank you for for. Um putting that question to me. I um, am not saying safety should not be first. I, I don't want to be understood as saying that at all. Um, what I'm responding to is the proposal and the budget change proposal that said that that they're going to look at safety and it, the implication is they're not going to look at cost. And you just can't do one without the other. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you. Dr. Mitchell, technical consultant for the Mussey Great Road Alliance, which is... Welcome. Good, good morning, Chairman Hill and subcommittee members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to address the subcommittee. My name is Joseph Mitchell. I am a member of and expert witness for the Mussy Grade Road Alliance, a community-based 501c4 organization founded in Ramona, California in 1999 by Diane Conklin, my spouse. My background is in experimental particle physics, but since moving to California in 1999 from Europe, I developed expertise in the area of wildland fire, particularly related to power lines, and have authored academic publications on the subject. Since 2006, the Mussey Grade Road Alliance has, been, has regularly intervened at, on safety issues at the CPUC. We began intervening at the Commission on Power Line Safety, Fire Safety Issues uh, as a result of SDG&E's proposed Sunrise Power Link transmission project, one of the largest of its kind in California. The Alliance brought the issue of wildland fire 
in, from transmission lines to the attention of the Commission. This is the first time the issue had ever been addressed in a certificate for public necessity application. As a result of our intervention, the EIR for this project thoroughly addressed wildfire issues. Since then, the Alliance has continued to intervene in Commission proceedings regarding fire safety. The Alliance has submitted expert testimony and argument regarding fire safety resulting in numerous recommendations adopted by the Commission. Over a decade, we are and have been primarily safety interveners. The Alliance supports ensuring that there is an independent organization specifically dedicated to safety advocacy at the CPUC. We think that the Division of Safety Advocates, as described in Budget Change Proposal DF46, could potentially meet this need. However, we have some concerns and questions. The budget proposal categorically states that the Safety and Enforcement Division cannot serve as safety advocates pursuant to Senate Bill 636, which the budget proposal states prevents SED staff from serving in advocacy and advisory cap capacities in the same proceeding. However, our reading of SB 636 is that this restriction only applies to adjudicatory proceedings, not to rate-making or rule-making proceedings. We've had the opportunity to work on several commission proceedings in which SED, formerly the Consumer Protection and Safety Division, CPSD, played an active advocacy role, including the SDG&E Power Shutoff Plan, Wildfire Expense Balancing Account Application, and the wildfire safety rulemaking in which CPSD proposed and aggressively and successfully advocated for a number of rule changes. We partnered with CPSD for advocacy for two of our own successful proposals, fire data collection and creation of statewide fire maps. And if you would like to discuss the, the uh, Butte fire and the, the fire maps, I'd be happy to do that after presenta presenting. Given the historical record, I think it is important to ask what has led to the creation of an entirely new organization, Ex Nilo, that would provide, that, what would that provide that the creation of an independent organization within SED would not? How would the new organization work with the existing SED and risk assessment unit? How will information expertise flow freely between divisions? What will prevent siloing from occurring? The staff report prepared by Mr. Marina for the subcommittee is an excellent overview of this and other issues raised by the budget proposal. In particular, the Alliance concurs with concerns regarding the lack of an integrated approach to safety at the CPUC and the lack of clear delegation of responsibility within the Commission. Another concern that we share with the subcommittee staff is that the proposed safety advocates role would be centered on rate case analysis. However, there is currently a gap at the CPUC regarding initiation of rulemakings and the introduction and advocacy for rule changes. It appears that the Commission over the past couple of years has backed away from allowing or encouraging technical staff to actively advocate in Commission proceedings to fill, fill this role. As a result, rulemakings tend to be utility driven. This is a gap that must be filled and the role of the safety advocate enlarged and staffed for it. As a community intervener focusing primarily on wildfire issues, we do not have a formal position on what division the safety advocate should be placed in or what sort of supervisory structure should be created to support it. It is our expectation that a successful independent safety advocate must communicate and work seamlessly with the safety and enforcement division and risk assessment staff with the Office of Ratepayer Advocates and also with community interveners with on the ground knowledge. Without a coherent, unified approach to safety, the people of California will be subject to more catastrophes, more loss, and pain. The subcommittee must ensure that the mistakes of the past are not repeated in the future, and that safety is not a fiefdom, but a real and ever-present concern at the CPUC. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure we have questions will be coming in a little bit. appreciate the, the comments, and thank you for coming today and for the work you've been doing uh, at, the, uh, at the Alliance. Um, Ms. Safar. So I will go ahead and, and give um, our points, and then I'll hand it over to Amy uh, okay. to the extent that I I'm miss anything. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, but she's told me to cover everything. So. <laughs> um, Only first, told me to do the same. <laughs> um, first, I think I think we agree with with everything that's been said so far. Um, 
The goal of this uh, Division of Safety Analysis is twofold. Um, one is we need to fill the existing gap uh, in our proceedings, which is tes testimony on safety in the proceedings so that commissioners are able to make a balanced decision between cost and safety. Number two is to promote best practices throughout the commission and promote a safety culture. Um, I think what what Q said, uh, you know, your focus was on um, rate cases, and I and certainly uh, this division will um, participate in rate cases to bring that co uh, to bring that safety perspective. Um, you know, and, and I I tend to agree a lot with uh, Tom Long uh, with Turn on on your concerns on cost and where you're going with with uh, the focus of the division of safety analysis should be in. It was, you know, you, you mentioned that it should be refocused. And maybe the, the BCP that we put in, we, we focus a lot on explaining how we would participate in a general rate case. But that shouldn't be, uh, that, that's not the intention of the Division of Safety Analysis. Our focus is, as you said, to get, in, to get involved in the SMAP, to get involved in the RAMP, and to make sure that the utilities prioritize um, their risk and give us the right information, give us the right models. Um, and then as far as um, Massey grade, you mentioned that we shouldn't have silos, um, that we should work seamlessly with other interveners and that we should work seamlessly with our uh, safety and enforcement division. And this division on its own, it's too small to function on its own. We need to work with Q and with interveners and with SED to be able to bring value um, to, uh, as part of our testimony. And um, Ms. Jackson for City of San Bruno, um, you know, an ind independent monitor or outside interveners would be great. It's a great idea. Um, we've been waiting for it. Um, it's been five years, and, and we don't have a safety intervener. So this is our effort of putting a safety intervener out there. But we are hoping that the testimony that we put as a division of safety analysis, that it will ultimately f bring a safety intervener, an outside safety intervener, it would either Either turn or others will bring more engineer, uh, engineers in their te as part of their testimony, or we're going to get an actual, uh, a, a solely an intervener solely based on on safety. So that is our ultimate goal. And to the extent that we have more and more safety interveners come into our proceeding, then we can pull back. And 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 the commission, you know, the the ultimate goal is for the commissioners to have a balanced record that has cost and has safety. Amy, did I miss anything? Um, I think the, the one issue um, that we also do want to emphasize, I, I think Mr. Sullivan had, had said it earlier, is that you know, the Division of Safety Analysis is, you know, in, is to be independent. And I know there were a couple concerns that uh, there will be utility influence. Um, that's one thing that, you know, as a division, you know, we're not looking to be influenced um, by the utilities, the experts that we would be getting, um, you know, to come in. And th that is part of the reason of reaching out to academia and looking at other uh, safety organizations is we're building that coalition so that our, ex our expertise is coming from the safety community, not from the utilities. It gives us a different lens to look through things. We, we should not be looking through the same lens as a utility. And I, and I think that's something that we all agree with. And, and I would agree. Yes. that we all have is, you know, with the current leadership and, and management, there's a comfort level that that would exist and that that would be the process. But we saw under the same structure the control that the former president had over the commission and the staff at every level. And that's the fear for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why there's some, some skepticism and some concern Okay. And, and today, I, I can understand that. I appreciate that. Um, today, that is the feeling, you know, part of the, the purpose for Division of Safety Analysis, as Ms. Safar has said, is you know, to also have other interveners, you know, coming in and becoming more uh, balanced, I, you know, or, or also, you know, looking at, you know, if we could get another safety intervener from outside uh, coming in and also developing, that would 
also create some of, you know, I think allay some of the concerns you have is now you do have another voice. It's not just right now, I know you're, you're looking at this may be the one voice that's coming out first, this, but this is uh, based on what is before us right now. This is what we've proposed and we feel this is the right approach. Uh, we're certainly not adverse to having and encouraging other interveners to come in. And I think that to the point where DSA can facilitate that, yeah, we would be working at that as well. 